I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know is true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all life. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. A little different because it's evening, but this is the highest and holiest holiday. A celebration, really. Um, The Passion Week. I pray and ask that even now your hearts would be preparing yourselves to hear what Jesus did for us that night that we called Good Friday. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And we thank you for the amazing love that you showed each one of us. 
How could it be you would send your son to die for us? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for offering yourself as a sacrifice for us. And Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us the power to live victorious lives. We ask that in the short time we have this evening that even though in some ways it's a somber time, it's the beginning of the victory. And we just ask that you be with us now. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. We hope you're out there virtually and those of you here to celebrate what we call Good Friday. You know, we call it Good Friday because it is good for us. Lord Jesus Christ on this evening paved the salvation that we have. That's the greatest joy that we can know in this life to know for a fact that we will be with God forever when we breathe our last here on earth. We will be with him in eternity. And so that is good. Those who don't know, haven't seen him in person, this is Pastor Josh, our youth pastor, and we're going to do some tag teaming. We're going to have some, a good time tonight. It's good for us, Good Friday, but it wasn't good for the Lord. You know, he suffered more in the last 24 hours of his life than he had in the first 33 years of his entire life that he lived on earth. And had you been there that day and stood at the crowd watching Jesus die, you would have heard him utter seven astounding statements. Remarkable words. Not only because they were under duress that he gave them, but because of the deep meaning that each conveyed. And so in these last seven words of Jesus, we find a lasting example of how you and I must think and how we must live. And so I asked Pastor Josh in these last seven words that we're gonna do a little tag team and give you those words. I will do the even ones, he'll do the, no, strike that, reverse it. I'll do the odd ones because I'm odd and he'll do the even ones, uh, even ones. And so whether you're here virtually or in person, I pray that God will bless you with this knowledge. Let's start with the first. Statement one, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Jesus asked his father to forgive them, but that begs the question, who, who are the them? Perhaps he was thinking of the thousands who just five days earlier had hailed him as the coming Messiah, coming to the city, riding on a donkey, and people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Maybe he was thinking about them. Or maybe he was thinking about Pontius Pilate, the governor, who said, crucify him. Or maybe it was Governor Pilate who was so personally weak that he gave in to the crowds and let the Jews cry out, call, crucify the Lord. Maybe he asked to forgive them. You know, Pontius Pilate, washing his hands of the mess, did not excuse him from guilt. Maybe Jesus was thinking of the religious leaders or maybe he was thinking of the soldiers who whipped him and forced him to carry the cross. Or maybe he was thinking of the soldier who drove the, the spikes, the nails through his wrists and ankles. Who were the they? Was it the Jews? Was it the religious leaders? Was it the governor, the soldiers? And as I thought about it, I thought to myself, does it really matter? None of them deserve forgiveness. And yet, Jesus, being full of grace, asked his father, the judge and arbiter of all, to forgive them. And on what basis were they to be forgiven? He says, because they didn't know what they were doing. Now, let's be real. They knew exactly what they were doing to Jesus. But what I think the Lord meant is that from a, an eternal perspective, they had no clue that in essence, they were putting themselves on the cross for their own sins. They were being crucified for their own sins. And here's the truth for us today. I, I look at the sea of humanity and whether one takes on the label of Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or agnostic, atheist, or whatever allegiance that people put themselves to, they are truly ignorant of the consequences of being aligned with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Had they known what the Lord Jesus said in Philippians chapter two, at the end when it says, every knee will bow on heaven and earth and every tongue will confess, not just believers, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so the reality is that even though the non-believer was not there, they would have done the same thing as the Jews. They would have yelled out, crucify him. And the Lord had the same response for them. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So for us, as the Lord's followers, we should remember that when non-believers hurt us as well, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the eternal consequences of their actions and thoughts. And it's then that we should have the same mindset as Jesus and ask our Heavenly Father to forgive them, just as he's forgiven us. That's word number one. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Here's number two. So going on to the second statement, <clears throat> which is... Can you hit this? Give it a second here. I think the thing it's is... Coming. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Statement number two. Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. This is what he says as he's on the cross in between two criminals. And he says this to the second criminal, um, Dying on the cross with them. And this is the last, the last, if you look at the last words of the dying sinner that was right next to him, I mean, they're pretty profound. In fact, they're the word, they're the prayer of faith. It's a prayer of faith, right? He confesses his sin. He says he acknowledges the just punishment he deserves. He says, we deserve the punishment that we're getting. He also recognizes the sinlessness of Jesus. He says, this man has done no wrong. In fact, he doesn't belong up here with us. He doesn't belong among us. And lastly, he discovers repentance towards God when he simply asks Christ to simply remember him. But this, this, this statement here is also so simple. You know, Jesus' Jesus's words are so simple and yet so profound. You will be with me in paradise. You see, the word paradise is only used three times in the whole New Testament. But within, within the context of all of those passages, it does refer to heaven. But it's interesting because that, that word, that Greek word for paradise is actually derived from an ancient Persian word meaning a park or a garden. So it's almost like Jesus is saying, you know the place that Adam and Eve enjoyed before all of this went crazy? That's the place that you and I will enjoy. That's the place you will be. But more profoundly is the two words that are kind of squished in the middle of that statement, with me. You know, Jesus doesn't say, you will be in paradise. He says, you will be with me in paradise. You see, Jesus' life-giving message has always been about relationships. And that's the essence of the gospel. The gospel is not primarily about forgiveness and salvation. It's, it's, more, it's more than just receiving heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God sent Christ to die so that we may be what? We may be reconciled to him. The relationship may be repaired. The relationship may be restored. What is Jesus basically saying? Paradise isn't paradise without Jesus. Mm, amen. Heaven isn't heaven without God. I want, you to, I want us to think about that. Because being with Jesus is paradise. Being with Jesus amen. is heaven. And that is exactly what eternal life is. You see, you look at the criminal. He wasn't asking for strength. Go, Lord, give me the strength to get myself off of here. He wasn't looking for deliverance. He wasn't even asking the Lord for heaven. You know, it, just imagine yourself there in, in his loneliness and his hopelessness. His, his, um, his crime is posted there for everyone to see and to, for, to shame him. It becomes more apparent as his feelings that the life is leaving him. And he turns to Jesus and believing in him, he asks only of the smallest relational connection with him. He says, remember me. And Jesus gave him more than he bargained for. Jesus basically, in essence, says, I'll do more than just remember you. You will be with me. And so if we're trusting in Christ as a means to attain heaven, then, we're, then we have seriously misunderstood both, both the idea, the concept of what heaven is and who Jesus is. And so when he says to, when he looks, turns to the criminal and says, you will be with me in paradise, that's a powerful statement and that's a wonderful statement for us as well. Amen. Going on to the third statement. Woman, behold your son. And to the disciple he said, here is your mother. 
Uh, you know, there's a saying, many of you have heard it, maybe it was said of you, <laughs> he's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. Right here, we can see that this obviously didn't apply to Jesus. See the woman referred to right here? That's his birth mother, Mary. And I was thinking about my, that saying, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is looking at the cross. Can you imagine, moms, the pain you would feel if you saw your son hanging on a cross for not doing anything wrong? Imagine seeing the agony and the pain and knowing that your son, because he is God, could call down 10,000 angels to rescue him, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it because that wasn't his mission. You see, he understood that he is a sacrificial lamb who would take away the sins of the world, and yet he realized upon his death as a man that he's the firstborn and that he's supposed to take care of his mother and he can't do it anymore. And so he assures his aged mother that even though he's leaving, even in the sacrifice and pain he had, he's taking care of her. And to the disciple in whom the gospel says he loved, that's John, the youngest of them, he said, this is your mother. And history and tradition points out that John did indeed take care of her. Our family had the opportunity to go to Ephesus in Turkey, and we were pointed to the place where the house was where John took care of Mary. Well, what does that mean for us today? Well, what it means is this. Relationships, friends, people are the most important aspect of life. You know, getting our kids educated, yeah, that's important. And, and maybe amassing wealth, uh, living the good life, it, it seems like it's important, but it's all temporal. It's all going to go away because, like Jesus, we will eventually breathe our last just hopefully, <laughs> we don't want as painful a death as him, but we will all breathe our last. And so, whether God is giving you one day, a week, a month, year, decades, the bottom line is this. Whatever time you and I have left on earth, we should be taking care of our loved ones. That means, first of all, pointing out to Savior. That means if you have children, you are nurturing them in the Lord. That means to your coworkers and friends and neighbors and relatives, we are pointing people to Jesus. But it also means that you and I take the wealth that God has given us and we use it to help others. Just like Jesus, he thought about his mother while he was dying on the cross. You know, there's a story of a wealthy man who, who he begged God, will you let me take my bricks, my gold bricks, with me to heaven? And so when he finally breathed his last, he shows up at the pearly gates, you know, this is your classic pearly gates, and he's got a suitcase with his wealth all in there. And St. Peter meets him there and says, hey, what's that? And he opens up the suitcase, and he says, what, pavement? <laughs> The point is, not only can you not take it to heaven with you, but you're not going to need it because the brick of gold in heaven is just pavement. It's nothing. But that wealth that you and I had, that man had those bricks of gold, he could have used it to bring more people to the Lord, to take care of people, to fund missionaries, to share the gospel. And we need to think of Jesus that way. We need to be earthly good so that we can take others to heaven. Amen. Right now, we're going to participate in the communion, the Lord's Supper. And we'd ask right now, if you're home, you want to quickly get some uh, juice and bread, that would be great. We have Janice right here passing those elements out. If you have not received one and you are a believer, you're a born-again Christian, we'd ask that you raise your hand right now so that Janice can get to those, thank you, in the back here. The communion, the Lord's Supper, is a very high and holy privilege. I appreciate, if you haven't heard uh, Pastor Josh, he has been doing a devotion starting with Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday, and going on every day. And yesterday, Thursday, was to talk about the Lord's Supper. 
that night when he was with his disciples in that upper room. And he's sharing a last meal. It's a very intimate time. And they're afraid because Jesus said on that night, John 14, I'm going to leave and where I go, I'm preparing a place for you. And they were scared. They didn't know what he was talking about. He says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm offering you my body. I'm offering you my blood. And so that supper, he broke the bread. Now the communion, taking these elements doesn't save you. But it is for believers. It is for those who place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you've done that tonight, uh, if you've done it in the past, you are welcome to take the element. And by the way, even if you accept the Lord Jesus tonight and you were doing it right now, we'd love for you to take of the elements. But it is for believers. And the reason why, uh, if you took it without being a believer, it would have no meaning for you. It, it would be, it would have no purpose. But for a Christian, it is identifying with the Lord in his death and the fact that he has forgiven us for our sins. So I'm gonna do the uh, bread and then Pastor Josh will, will do the cup. First Corinthians 11, the apostle Paul says this, for I received from the Lord that which I passed on to you, that on the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he, he took the bread and he said, this is the new covenant. Wait a minute. Man, I'm getting all messed up because I'm, this bread is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you have the element, let's take it together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sacrificing your body for us. You broke your body so that we might have new bodies in heaven. I pray that, Lord, as we appropriate this, we would remember your graciousness to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then after that, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, take this and drink it. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory. Lord, we just thank you for shedding your blood for us. You are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You are the last sacrificial Lamb, the last sacrifice um, that paid the debt for our sin, for all our sin for our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, for all our sins, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. And um, we thank you that we are part of this new covenant, Lord, that we get to enjoy the blessings of eternal life, to enjoy the blessings of a relationship with you because of that, Lord. And so we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now we go to statement number four. Statement number four. Right. This will test your Aramaic, <laughs> Pastor Aramaic. Josh. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? That's, uh, that is what Jesus is saying in Aramaic or the English translation or what he was saying is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, have you ever found yourself in the depths of humiliation? I mean, I'm not just talking about embarrassed because you did something goofy, but I'm talking about like utter disgrace. You know, take some time to really understand and empathize with Jesus here. There's another Old Testament passage, a psalm actually, that starts off with these very same words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's Psalm 22. And this psalm is written by King David while he was a fugitive running away, hunted by, by King Saul. You know, and this rhetorical question is saturated with so much, so much emotion. I mean, think about it, Christ, at this, at this moment, Christ had been deserted by his own disciples. He'd been hated by his own people. He'd been mocked by his enemies. You know, throughout Jesus' entire life, the Father was always there with him, right? John chapter 14, 11, he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In fact, even before the creation of the world, Right? He was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Right? Until this very moment, there has never been a point in eternity past where Jesus, where the Son, felt estranged.
from the Father. And now, at the precipice, at the, at the height of his suffering, he had felt abandonment by his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 5, it says, Surely, it, it prophesies about this very thing. It says, Surely he, that's Jesus, took up our, our pain and bore our suffering. We consider him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. I mean, imagine the suffering you cause. Imagine just the, the sin, right, and the suffering that your sin causes. Imagine that suffering placed on Jesus' back. I'm just, I'm just talking about the sin about, that you committed today. Now, now take that and multiply it by all the sins of your entire life. And then take that weight and multiply it by the sins of the whole world. I mean, that, that's a pretty heavy load. Why had the father turned his face away from the son? Because in that moment, he was delivered into his enemy's hands. He bore the weight of our sin. He willingly surrendered to God's wrath. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 continues to say, says, He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God. And yet, I think this is so cool, that even in the midst of his agony, Christ maintains the possession of his heavenly father. He doesn't say, God, God. He says, my God, my God. You are still my God. You are still my father. And right, this shows that he is still committed to it. Even in his last dying breath, he is still committed to this father's will. And when we acknowledge that Christ died for us, right, to pay that penalty for our sins, this is a truth that we ought to not trivialize. Right? In fact, we ought to be eternally grateful because Christ was abandoned for our sake. God will never abandon us. Amen. I think that's such an amazing picture. Because, because Christ was abandoned by God, God will not abandon us for our sakes. Moving on to statement number five. Very simple. I thirst. <laughs> you know, of all the sayings... <laughs> All the seven sayings. This is the one uh, that most of us probably can relate to because we live in the desert, desert. right? Yeah. And today, wow, it was a hot one it today. Was. It was very hot. I was thirsty. But you know what? The thirstiness that the Lord had was not because he lived in a dry climate, although it was very dry in, in Palestine. But certainly also he hadn't eaten or drank in many hours. In addition, he had the loss of blood because of the beatings and, and everything, the exhaustion of carrying the cross out of the city gates to Golgotha. His nerves racking with the pains of his circumstance. And yes, he was exposed to the heat and the dry climate. And all of that took its toll. He was a superman, he was human, but boy, he was strong. Because only at this point he said, I thirst. And when I read that, this in the gospel is, it reminds me that Jesus is human. Mm. It's not that he's God, we know he's God. Just like Pastor John, he's been with the Father since eternity, since he created everything, but he's also a man. He's the God man, not the man God. And I like what one writer put it, he said this, Jesus was deity in a human body, in a human suit. And I think that's kind of clever, but I think it doesn't fully help us understand what Jesus did for us. You see, in the 33 years that he lived on the earth, we forget, maybe we watch all these movies and we see this stoic Jesus and he never faltered. He was thirsty, friends. He was hungry. He was dirty. He was tired. He sweat. And he smelled, okay? Even though he was a carpenter by trade, very strong, I'm sure at the end of some of those days his muscles ached. Perhaps he had headaches. And certainly, thinking about what mankind was going through, he had heartaches. And the writer of Hebrews puts it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. That's the one difference. We're all human. Jesus was human, but he never sinned. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. 
So what that tells us about the Lord is that unlike other religions who worship their God as something otherworldly, you know, this, our, our God, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, was able to identify with us in every way. Whatever you are going through right now, Jesus can identify with you in your pain, your suffering, your loneliness. As you and I thirst for water, so too, like him, we have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We should be just like Jesus. We have another song from the worship team. Let us remember. Where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Was it for Christ that I have died cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day Amen. it was there by faith that I received my sight ah, so, so, so powerful all right, sixth statement, second to last statement that Jesus said. I love, this is my favorite statement that Jesus made. It is finished. Amen. The three most beautiful words that I think are most, the most beautiful words in scripture. But actually, it's just, it's actually a single Greek word, right? <laughs> but what exactly was finished? What exactly was finished on the cross? A lot of people think it's just, you know, a simple dying on the cross to pay for our sins. So much actually was accomplished. Jesus accomplished so much by dying on the cross. First, the redemptive work for which God the Father had sent him to do was complete. He, he finished his Father's will. It was his will, his purpose to do the Father's will, right? In John chapter 4, he says, this is my food. This is the thing that sustains me is to do my Father's will. And his death on the cross was like the pinnacle of his life's mission. What else? What was finished? All the Old Testament prophecies which pointed to the coming Messiah, and it pointed to his suffering, prophesied of his suffering. All those prophecies were fulfilled. You know, in a single day, from the time Judas betrayed Jesus up to the moment that Jesus was buried, there are about 30 Old Testament prophecies that have been fulfilled. And the earliest of these prophecies goes back way, way, way to the beginning in Genesis, given by God himself to Adam, when he says, he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It was, it was amazing. What was finished, God had finally kept the promise that he had made to his people so many years ago. What was finished? The punish, obviously, the punishment for sin. The punishment for sin was paid in full. 
right? It, the, it's the beautiful thing about it is he doesn't say, my part is finished, now it's up to you, don't drop the ball. <laughs> it's all encompassing. He's saying it is finished. The, the payment for sin, for every kind of sin, for the trivial sin, and for the most heinous of sins, for the sins that, that everyone seems to know about, you, all, your, all your sins that everyone seems to know about, and all your secret sins that no one knows about. Jesus does know that. All the sins of your past and all the sins of your future. You know, we, we cannot complete what he already completed, right? There's, there's, no, there's no picking up where he left off, right? There was an evangelist, an evangelist was approached by a man, right? And he was asking, he was asking this evangelist in a kind of flippant and mocking way, you know, he said, what must I do to be saved? And, you know, and the, the evangelist replied, well, it's too late, right? <laughs> and he's like, whoa, too, you know, it's too late for me to be saved? It's too late for me to go to heaven? And the evangelist says, no, it's too late for you to do anything because it's already been done. Amen. Right? The only thing that is required of you is that you repent and believe. What was finished? Not just the payment for sin, not just the Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled, not just the Father's work being done, but the God's law was also fulfilled. Right? Jesus kept the letter of the law by perfectly keeping the spirit of the law in his life. And Jesus kept the sentence of the law by satisfying the punishment of the law in his death. The Lamb of God had finally been sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. And because of this, we are no longer under law, but we are under grace. And so we shouldn't live like we're still under the law. We shouldn't live chained to a certain moral standard to rule, you know, ruled by religious ex expectations. And on the same token, we shouldn't live like we're free from any law, right? We shouldn't be living freely and lasciviously, selfishly, because what we do is we cheapen Jesus' sacrifice. But instead, we should live under grace, right? Desiring to be more like Jesus, the more we learn about him, the more we obey him, the more we follow him. That's what was finished on the cross. It wasn't just that he paid for our sin. It, was, it, it means so much more. And it means so much more for us as well. Moving on to statement seven. The fifth state, uh, seventh statement, the final statement. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is the seventh and final statement that Jesus gave here on earth before he went back to heaven. By the way, this is my favorite statement. <laughs> it's about three o'clock in the afternoon and Jesus had spent about six hours on the yeah. cross. You know what's interesting? Normally a person could survive on a cross for days, but they needed him to die before mm -hmm. the Sabbath, Saturday. So they were ready to break his legs, because then he couldn't breathe anymore. So six hours he hung on the cross. And scripture tells us at three o'clock in the afternoon, which should be daytime, blackness covered the entire land. And this darkness was not just some physical phenomena. Friends, it was also the spiritual reality of the world. Jesus literally having all the sins of all of mankind, as Pastor Josh said, on his shoulders. And that's when Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And what's funny is the other sound that they would have heard beyond the Lord's anguish was the sound of ripping cloth. And you're saying, what are you talking about? Well, in the temple, in a place called the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant lay, there was a curtain that barred anyone from going into the Holy of Holies. And it was separated. Only the high priest was allowed to enter, and even he, only one day on Yom Kippur, the day of the atonement, where he offered a sacrifice for all of the people. And so what separated the holy place from the holy of holies, where the ark was, was a curtain. And that curtain separated sinful man on the outside from holy God who was on the inside. But when Jesus shouted these last words, it was heard, the curtain tore lengthwise from top to bottom. 
And this, oh, I love this. This is symbolic of the fact that now all believers, not just the high priest, but all believers have access to God. Amen. That's why in the Catholic tradition we call upon the priest, right? The Pope, to come and intercede for the people. You tell your sins to them, you confess. No more. Bible says when, when the curtain was torn, he, we who put our faith in Jesus, you and I now have direct access to the Heavenly Father. There is nothing blocking the way. Just as your child, hopefully, when they're really young, feels so close to you, they can come up and hug you or a toddler climbs into your arms, so too we can do the same to our Heavenly Father. Jesus said we cry, Abba, which literally means Daddy. And we can go up to God the Father and literally call him Daddy. I don't know what other religions you know about, but no other religion calls God Daddy. Only us. Only us. We Christians. Remember that when you feel alone and unloved, that may be your feeling. That's what you feel, but it's not reality. Your Heavenly Father is right there for you. God loves you. And as Jesus committed himself to the Father, so too you and I commit ourselves to our Heavenly Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. The veil has been opened. Amen. We now have access to God the Father. Enter in to that rest, as the writer of Hebrews says. Would you just bow your head with me right now? I can't help but believe in these seven statements, you have heard what we call the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, willingly went to the cross to die for our sins, your sins. And if you look deep into your heart, you know you feel the conviction of the fact that you stand condemned before God. But the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever puts their faith in him, that Lamb of God, then you will be saved. It says, if you and I confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And by the way, this is Good Friday, but Sunday is what it's all about, friends. Sunday's coming. Heaven. Sundays are coming. But that's what it's all about. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ by a simple prayer, you just say, Lord, I recognize tonight I'm a sinner and I stand before you condemned, but I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. I want you to come into my life Take away my sin. Make me the man, the woman, the young person of God that you want me to be. And the Bible says if you do that, then God will fulfill his promise. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. The psalmist says as far as the east is from the west, so far as he's removed our transgression. And then you are given this very unique gift that no other religion talks about, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes in and gives you the power to live. And if that Spirit right now is convicting you to accept Jesus, don't, don't wait. Do it tonight. I'm going to pray for you right now. You can pray along with me if that's your prayer. Father, I pray for these people. If there's any here tonight who want to accept Jesus, that they could say this. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing me to come to the service. Thank you for letting me hear the message of salvation. Thank you for allowing your son to go on the cross to die for my sins. I want to accept him as my savior. I want to repent of my sins. I want to be the person you want me to be. And through your power in the Holy Spirit, I want to live for you. The Bible says if you've done that, you're born again. You're a child of God. And that means two days from now on Sunday, you can celebrate the most holy of holidays, the risen Savior, and know that someday you will rise from the dead as well. Let's close this time with a song. John, will you lead us, please?
house of the Lord this evening. And again, if you've made that profession of faith, if you've accepted the Lord, maybe you have some questions and you really want to know. I want to ask you to contact me. If you're a young person, please contact Pastor Josh. He'd love to talk to you about faith in Jesus Christ. And so uh, tonight is it. It's in the words of a famous preacher, Friday is here, but baby, Sunday is a coming. And two week, uh, days from now, we want you to join us at 10.30 in the morning. We have RSVP, I think 60 plus of you coming. So we're excited, excited. and we're excited to see you. And we see some of the youth here tonight. So Pastor Josh, we're gonna see some of your youth here as well. And uh, we're just really glad that you're here tonight. Right now, I'm gonna ask uh, Pastor Josh to give us our benediction, and then you are dismissed. Awesome. Well. <clears throat> In the, uh, the words of the Holy Spirit, the, uh, the fellowship of the believers, um, I now bless you guys. You may be dismissed. Amen.